Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover, and this is episode 227 of The Lawyerist Podcast. We are part of the Legal Talk Network, and today I'm talking with Bob Ambrogi about the state of legal podcasting and blogging. Today's podcast is brought to you by Arag, Ruby Receptionist, Lex Reception, and Text Expander. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned. We will tell you more about them later on. So this month we're focusing on marketing and I want to start with client personas and how to segment your audience. And if that just sounds like marketing speak, let's start by talking about who is your ideal client. Like if you could build an avatar of the perfect client for you, what would that person be? What would be their essential qualities? And that's what we mean by a client persona. Now, client personas are risky. They can be because if you get too specific, you start ignoring other clients that really are ideal, but maybe didn't make it into your description. So the way to do this is to sit down and identify, like you can give this persona a name, you know, but if you give it a man's name, be careful that you're not excluding women, obviously. Don't make them so real that you focus in on one person. Or maybe create a selection of personas that together represent a cross-section. And the idea here is that you can start thinking about how could I market to this person, right? What sorts of problems does this person have? And here's what I would do is create this person, you know, like what are their essential qualities? Maybe it's important what kind of car they drive. Maybe that helps you understand who they might be. Or maybe it's important where they live, but it's definitely important what kinds of problems are they facing. Like that is absolutely essential, but maybe there are some things around attitude or background that play into, are they going to make a good client? Now, I want you to try and tell the story of their journey to the door of the lawyer who is going to help them, who they're going to hire. Because problems don't arise as legal problems, right? Let's say you are potentially getting divorced. Well, Before you're trying to get divorced, you're trying to stay together. And while you're trying to figure out how to stay together, maybe you're in therapy. Maybe you're trying to resolve fights with your spouse. Maybe you're worried about co-parenting with somebody who has a dependency or mental illness, or maybe you're just struggling, period. And maybe before that, there are other problems in the relationship. Maybe sex isn't happening anymore. And so you're trying to resolve stuff like that. So I'm using divorce because I think there's a lot of obvious examples along the journey of that ideal client before they're even thinking about hiring a lawyer, right? So there's a lot of opportunities to help that person or to be a significant influence in their life or give them something valuable or just intersect them somehow before they ever get to the point where they're shopping for lawyers. Because that's sometimes touted as the great advantage of online advertising, right? Is that you can intersect somebody at the exact moment they're trying to buy what you're selling, which is true, But everybody's trying to do that, right? Everybody's trying to buy keywords for divorce lawyer Oklahoma. And that is a really expensive thing to win. But earlier on, you can be the only lawyer that client is ever going to call if you can intercept them earlier on at a point where you can help them. So before you start trying to worry about winning search terms like, you know, Oklahoma divorce lawyer, worry about winning search terms like arguing with my spouse and staying together and rescuing my marriage and co-parenting with an abusive spouse or, you know, whatever. You can build your marketing campaigns around that, whether it's giving local seminars, you know, talking to different kinds of networking groups, or publishing articles in the local paper or the church bulletin or writing a blog or just creating resources on your own website that are free to people if they drop an email address to you or something like that. Now we have a client persona template, but I think you can just as easily sit down and think through like what are the essential elements of your ideal client and then start describing the journeys that those people are most likely to take to you and you can start identifying points along the way where you could help, not as a lawyer, necessarily, but just as a person who understands how these situations go and can give good advice or good information or valuable content or products or whatever. That's what you're trying to do. If you want to get our client persona template, you can find it in the library on our website and it's free to insiders. So check that out. Starting with your clear understanding of who your client is that you're trying to reach, who the ideal client is that you're trying to reach is the key to everything that comes after. We'll talk about marketing strategy in the next couple of weeks and we'll talk about more around this 
but you have to start with a really good understanding of who your client is and their journey to your door. And that starts potentially, if you don't already understand all that stuff, it starts with conversations with your clients. So go out and talk to your clients and find out what their journey was and then get our worksheet and work from there. So now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Brie Forsyth from Lex Reception, and then we'll have my conversation with Bob. Hi, Sam. I am Brie Forsyth, the brand leader of Lex Reception. I have been with the company for over 10 years, and I currently reside right outside Boise, Idaho. Our company is hubbed out of Portland, Oregon. Hi, Bree. Thanks so much for being with us today. And I know you were talking about where you live and where the company is headquartered because today we're going to talk about Lex Reception's Anywhere business model, which I take to mean that people who work for Lex Reception can work wherever they need to or want to. So where did that idea come from? Yeah, so we like to call it anywhere. Um, we've heard it called remote, and that feels isolated. That feels like we're on our own island somewhere. So we call it anywhere. Um, our founders started in a garage in Portland, Oregon, back in the 90s. Mm. And we eventually expanded to a traditional office building in a suburb of Portland called Tualatin. And this is where my story really begins. Every day, I would have to commute into work. I don't know if you know anything about Portland. Portland traffic, but it's pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. um, anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour spent in my commute. Sometimes I would arrive to work kind of angry and having mm. to turn my happy on and start taking phone calls was a challenge for me. And then back when we saw the economy crash around 2008, we really saw an uptick in a higher caliber of employees realtors, mortgage brokers, other business professionals looking for work for the first time in years. And they found our model for work from home very attractive. So that's kind of where this idea of working from home got sparked. And you've explained this as fitting work into life rather than the other way around. This is one aspect of the work-life balance that everybody seems to be looking for. It's really huge. It really is our culture, is helping to fit work into life rather than the other way around. More time with family, friends, fur babies, and hobbies. It <laughs> leads to a happier life, which really projects over the phone. When our employees are happy, our clients really take notice. One of the concerns about this, I think, is like background noise and the environment that people work in. Like, it's great to work from home, but if there are barking dogs and screaming kids or loud coffee shops, it doesn't really work that well, especially for receptionists. So, like, what are your rules around ensuring that environment works? Really strict expectations and processes, procedures in place to make sure that the expectation is that we are commuting into our office just as if we were sitting in a car, although we meander down the stairs and into our office in our comfy space slippers rather than an anxiety filled car ride into an office. So the commute looks different, but the idea is the same. When we're handling the most precious phone calls for our businesses, we have to make sure that our technology is top notch, everything is quiet, and we have safety mechanisms in place. When we were in a brick and mortar call center, we faced ISP outages, power outages, internet outages. These struggles that we faced just naturally started to go away when we started working from home. We've helped businesses through some of the biggest hurricanes of all times, Katrina, Harvey, Florence. Those are a few that come to mind since I've been here. And I'll never forget those stories that I heard during those times from clients who called thanking us endlessly for being there for them during those terrifying times. They didn't know if they were going to lose their homes, all of their worldly possessions, but knowing that their business calls were still being taken care of was one last thing that they had to worry about. And that piece and those stories, it's really what it's all about and how we're changing, trying to change the way that the world works and helping our clients cut that tether between actually having to be in the office while running their business. Plus leap day is free. Yeah, we, you know, we're 24-7, 365. We do throw in that extra day on leap years. That's on us. Yeah. It's just one of the many things that, that we do for our clients. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> We have clients who've been able to take their first vacation knowing their business is still going to thrive while they're thriving on a sunny beach somewhere. This is the type of difference that we aim for and what sets us apart in this competitive market. This is the infinite game that we're trying to play. So listeners, visit LexReception.com slash lawyerist to learn more and look for Lex Reception's upcoming webinar about how you can take your practice anywhere. Thanks so much, Bree. Thank you.
This is Bob Ambrosi. I write a blog called Lost Sites. I also uh, write on Above the Law, a weekly column there, and I do a podcast called Law Next. And, oh, yeah, and you're associated with Lexblog these days. And I am the publisher and editor. <laughs> thank you for reminding me. I am the <laughs> publisher and editor-in-chief of Lexblog. Bob, thanks for coming back to the podcast. I think the last time we talked about the state of legal technology a year or two ago, today we want to talk about the state of legal blogging and legal podcasting. And maybe we should take a minute to establish your cred here. I believe you have one of the first blogs and podcasts in the legal world, don't you? Well, I started blogging in 2002, which means uh, at this point I've been doing it for more than 16 years. I wasn't, wow. you know, I wasn't the first. There were others out there before me. Uh, I said one of. <laughs> yeah, I, w I was early. There, you, there yeah. were not a lot of blogs when I started or a lot of people who knew what a blog was, for that matter. If this were Sky, you'd, you'd be in the first wave <laughs> of blogging. Right. <laughs> and podcasting, I started just three years after that. I was I started a podcasting through the Legal Talk Network in 2005. As a matter of fact, we were, uh, Craig Williams and I, on the Lawyer to Lawyer podcast, were the first regular podcast on the Legal Talk Network. Wow. And uh, we did that for, we did it for more than 13 years. Craig is still going. I, I left that podcast last year and started my own called Law Next, kind of yeah. went off in my own direction. But So uh, my understanding is Law Next is a bit like Law Sites, your blog, where you're really trying to cover legal technology and innovation and with a focus on those innovators and on the technology. Yeah, that's right. I'm really kind of trying to focus in. Uh, our tagline is that we're focusing in on the innovators and entrepreneurs who are driving what What's next in law? Very cool. And then at Lexblog, tell me a bit about your role there. So I joined Lexblog in January 2018, so about a year and a half ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've known Kevin O'Keefe forever, it seems <laughs> like, uh, right. you know, through blogging. I mean, that's yeah. that's always it's always one of the fascinating things about blogging uh, in, in the earlier days and in social media more broadly now is, is the relationships you establish and build by doing that. And that's how I got to know Kevin. But we've talked a lot about the state of journalism and the state of blogging. And it seemed, it began to seem to us that uh, even as, I hate to say journalism is failing because it's not, journalism isn't failing, but the news business is, of course, facing challenges. In my day job, I'm, I'm a lawyer and represent newspapers and, and news media organizations. But, you know, it, it's been a challenging time for the news business. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's felt to me that blogging in the legal industry, in the legal profession is hotter than ever. You know, I'm constantly impressed by the fact that things that happen in law, developments that happen in law, whether they are news stories, trends, whatever, are getting thoroughly covered and vetted by bloggers. Mm -hmm. And so really what we tried to, what we've been trying to do with Lexblog over the last year and a half is to create a news and commentary site that's built around and structured around legal bloggers. So we've been inviting legal bloggers to register their RSS feeds with us. And uh, anybody, it's, there's no cost to do it. We'll add any blog at all. We'll, we do vet them for quality to make sure they're mm -hmm. not spam or anything, but we'll add any legal blog of any kind. And we've got about 22,000 bloggers on our platform right now. So the idea is to make the front page of Lexblog like the place to go and find people who are commenting on law and practice. That's right. That's exactly right. And then, and then beyond the front page to build out channels around areas of law or even geographic locations. So eventually mm. we'll have a, a number of uh, geographic channels. So if my small town legal journal has folded, the idea would be that I could probably find something like that on Lexblog. Right. I mean, it'll be a while before we get to your small town, but we'll, we will be, I mean, you know, California. Minneapolis isn't you know, that small. <laughs> we'll, we'll start. No, I don't mean that. But, you know, we'll start with, we'll start with states. Uh, we'll start with perhaps regions, you know, Europe, uh, Asia. We actually have a number of blogs from all over the world. This is not wow. just the United States. We have Chinese language blogs uh, coming through our system. So it's, it's pretty amazing. So I hope we've established our bona fides. Like I can't think of anything better, <laughs> anyone better than you to kind of be the person to talk to about what is legal blogging in 2019. Um, and maybe that's where we should start. Like what even counts as a blog now? Because most of the platforms that we publish blogs on are the same ones that we use to host websites of all kinds. So how do we know a blog when we see one in 2019? Well, that's a good question. I, I, you know, I think you're right that, you know, WordPress has probably become the most popular blogging platform and WordPress is being used for all sorts of purposes, including for website design and creation. But I think the key to a blog is that it's 
regularly updated and that it's devoted to covering a topic. It doesn't mean that's all you do. But, uh, you know, in my case, I write about legal technology. You know, lawyers may be writing about their practice area or, or something else that interests them. But they're updating it on a regular basis and they're covering a particular topic or, or commenting or writing about a particular topic. And I guess it's generally from the perspective of the author, right? Like there are group blogs and there are solo blogs, but I think something they mostly have in common is that it is Bob Ambrogi and his thoughts and observations about this thing, not necessarily dry objective commentary or, or information. Well, I'm not sure I totally agree with that. I, yeah. I, I, I think that's largely true. Uh, and certainly I think what part of what defines a blog is the voice of the blogger and, and the personality of the individual blogger as that comes through. You know, I personally come out of a journalism background. A right. lot of my career was in journalism, and I often try to write, uh, you know, objectively uh, in the style of of uh, news writing. And and you know, you can look at other blogs out there that are quite prominent. Uh, say SCOTUS blog, for example. Uh, you know, you'll see a mix on SCOTUS blog. You'll see pure. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they've had professional journalists working for them covering the Supreme Court, but then they also have the academics and the scholars and, and the practitioners who are commenting on what's happening at the Supreme Court. So it's a mix. But overall, you're right. It does kind of blur the line, though, between journalism and commentary, I suppose. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Is to me, blogs are journalism right now, and journalism mm -hmm. broadly and loosely defined. But, you know, I, ever since I've been working with Lexblog, I've kind of engaged in an exercise. And, and for a while, I was actually doing it as a weekly uh, newsletter and I've, I've kind of lapsed on doing that. But right. it take, take something that's <laughs> in the news, in the legal world, take something that's happened at the Supreme Court or some development out of new le important legislative development out of Congress or something. Uh, you'll often find that one of the first lines of, of reporting about that comes out of a blog. It's, it's often a legal blogger who is the one who's right, uh, reporting in, in an almost objective way about that decision. And then, you know, maybe the same day, within a couple of days, you'll start to see other blog posts coming out that start to provide some perspective and what does this mean and how does this apply to your clients. And that's part of what we're trying to do at Lexblog is to pull together those kind of disparate voices that are, you know, engaging in commenting and, and writing about news developments and, and organize them in a way that makes it more useful to the reader. Well, and I know like at Case Text, and I guess I should disclose I'm an advisor at Case Text, but Case Text is starting to use, and I think even through Lexblog, they're starting to provide law blogs as additional context for the cases that you're looking at. So in the sense yeah. that this is somehow that it's more relevant or more current or maybe just more interesting than your traditional law journals. Right. And uh, Lexblogs also feeds, sends its feed through uh, Fastcase. So right. when you're doing yep. research on Fastcase, you can, you can find blog posts that are relevant to your research. Absolutely. Okay. So is blogging still a thing? Like part, part of me feels like the heyday was like, you know, the gawker, you know, all of that stuff in what, 2010s ish is the early 2010s. And that the idea of somebody making a big, popular, well-trafficked personal blog is mostly now gone the way of the dodo and most blogging is corporate and doesn't look a whole lot like it, like traditional blogging outside of maybe like BuzzFeed. But I'm not sure that that's true. Maybe I'm just following fewer blogs. I don't know. Like, is it still a thing? And what is it? How does it look different today than it maybe did 10 years ago? Well, I'm... I know you're going to say I, it's a I, thing. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a thing. Part of it is what I was just talking about. I, I mean, I think in the legal profession, and and uh, that's you know what I'm most interested in, what I'm most focused on. I think blogging is hotter than it's ever been. I mean, to say we've got 22,000 bloggers on our platform, and we've barely scratched the surface. I mean, there are a lot of legal bloggers out there. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. It looks different, though, doesn't it? it? It looks different. Well, it's not the same kind of. It's become more mainstream in a way. It's become yeah. less sexy, if that's a word. I mean, yeah, there was a time when you could almost become a, a minor celebrity in some circles by blogging and, and making a name for yourself. And that doesn't happen so much. But but there are still people who are achieving success in their practice areas, not just people who started 10 years ago and, and built it up. There are people who can start a blog today and become recognized for it. What do you mean when you say recognized for it? Or like, what does success mean? Because like, this is not the, you know, like a, a really classic 
classic law blogger in my mind would be, say, Scott Greenfield, who sits down every morning and pumps out his thoughts on three or four different subjects and three or four different thousand word blog posts. And his blog is just him and his thoughts about things. But today, I feel like when I see somebody start a blog, it's more often done either obviously or less obviously as search engine optimization strategy or something like that. Is that what we mean by successful or are you looking at it in a different way? No, I'm looking at it a different way. I'm looking at a lawyer who begins not just, I don't mean to just confine this to lawyer, but mm-hmm. it, it, the ideal example is is a lawyer who is passionate about their area of law and they start writing about it in some way. Maybe they're just reporting on developments, but maybe they're adding their commentary and insights uh, and and their writing is so insightful and so passionate that people begin to notice it and people begin to follow them. And pretty soon they're getting invited to speak at conferences and they're getting recognized as an authority in their field. And, and maybe they were an associate in their firm and suddenly their uh, their name is uh, up on the, you know, the, the front door of their firm along with the other partners. You know, those kinds of stories happen all the time. Yeah. And in any area, I mean, the technology area where I where I write, uh, you know, I, I think I look at some I mean, I've been writing about tech for, as I say, I've been doing this for a long time. But you can look at somebody like a good example is a guy named, you know, Steve Embry, who sure. uh, Steve is a was a he wrote for us for a little while, actually. Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> so he's a trial lawyer for 30 years or, or more. I think. But a couple of years ago, decided he wanted to start covering technology and writing about technology. He retired from the practice of law, actually, started a blog called Tech Law Crossroads and, you know, wrote with the kind of the unique insight of somebody who'd been in the trenches for 30 years. And people took notice of his writing. And, you know, you, you know, Steve, he's not an ostentatious guy. He's not a big, uh, you know, self promoter necessarily. He's just out there writing good quality stuff about technology in the legal area. And people take notice. And the next thing you know, he's he's getting invited to conferences and people are talking about his stuff and he establishes a name. So uh, do you think of it like success as in blogging mainly as a way to establish authority and with that to earn media and earn stages where you can present and things like that? You have to define your own success and what you're trying to I do. But I, true, I, yeah. I think I think my point is that that yes, for those who are looking to establish, for a lot of lawyers, the reason they're blogging is to either bring in clients or to Mm -hmm. advance their careers in some other ways. I mean, that resonates with me because like when I was writing my consumer law blog, I definitely got some search traffic where people who were well-optimized landed on my stuff and then decided to hire me. But I also earned speaking engagements through that. And a lot of people became to know me as the, you know, one of the leading consumer rights lawyers in the state, whether or not that was justified or not. My blog led people to see me in that way. So that resonates with me. And I don't see any reason why that couldn't still work in 2019. So it still works. I mean, you still see voices coming up all the time and blinking on the name. Now, we were actually Kevin and I actually just did a webinar yesterday. Kevin was talking about a a woman who just started blogging. um, I think it was two years ago on cannabis law. Mm -hmm. And thanks in large part to her blogging. She has developed a national reputation as one of the top cannabis lawyers in the country. I mean, that stuff happens. You know, that's not the only reason to blog. There's any number of reasons to blog. And for me, you know, it's interesting for me because I don't do like tech consult. I mean, I write about technology, but I'm not trying to get clients per se in my through my blogging because I don't do tech consulting or anything like right. that. But you are one of the leading names in legal tech because you've written about it and podcasted about it for years, for sure. Right. I've gotten some pretty good speaking engagements <laughs> out of it. And I do, you know, have ads on my blog. So I get some revenue out of that, mm-hmm. as, as you know, because you guys used to sell the ads on my blog. So, I mean, I, I have, you know, motives in doing it, uh, but, but I just like, I just like doing it. I basically do it because it's fun. You know, I think about a lot actually, like if I were going to go back into day-to-day law practice today, how would I go about it? And one of the things I would do is if I wanted to establish myself as an an authority in an, in a niche practice, I, I would absolutely start a blog. That's probably the best way I can think of to do it. Yeah. And use that as an excuse to reach out to journalists and stuff, to earn media, to expand my network and build my reputation for sure, but just blog. Yeah. If you had somebody sitting down with you looking to start a blog today, what kind of mindset do you think they ought to have with respect to blogging and and what specific tips do you think you'd want to give somebody? 
if you want to start a blog, I think it's important to do it because you truly are passionate. Maybe passionate is too strong of a word, perhaps, but uh, you, you should you should really care about what you're going to be covering and write about because it's work to blog and to keep at it on a regular schedule. It's got to be something you care about. Mm -hmm. And you might not get recognized for it for a while. I mean, it takes time right. <laughs> to gain traction. It takes time. <laughs> I mean, the more you care about your topic and the more thought and work you put into your topic, the more quickly you're going to get recognized, mm -hmm. I, I think. I mean, there are a lot of spam blogs out there. There are a lot of lawyers who think that if they just put up a blog and they hire some copywriter to uh, repeat the phrase mm -hmm. uh, motor right. vehicle truck accident or something over and over again, that that's the key to being successful on the internet. And that may work for SEO. I don't know. I think the impression you want to give people is like, oh my God, this blogger is obsessed with this topic. If I want to learn more about this, if I want context for my news story, if I want if I want to hire a lawyer, or if I just want to know more about this topic, this kind of a nerd is the person I want to talk to because they are totally geeking out about this. I think that's the impression you want to give people. That's right. And geeking out intelligently. Yeah. <laughs> Not like some people we see on Twitter every morning or something. <laughs> right. But, but <laughs> you know, and I think the other thing, I think part of the mindset also is to recognize, and I think this is something that has changed dramatically with blogging over the years, is that I don't think a blog stands alone anymore. I think a blog is part of a, a mm. broader ecosystem of social media and that you can't just kind of post to your blog and, and then shut off the rest of the world. You need to be that that needs to be part of an ecosystem of activity where you're also on Twitter and you're also on LinkedIn and you're also on Facebook. Because your blog is kind of where you're directing people to from all those other things. Yeah, you're directing people there, but you also want to have, you know, people don't comment on blogs very much right. anymore. They make, they're more likely to comment on Twitter about something you've written on your blog and, and you need to engage with them there and you need to be engaging with other people's blogs and commenting on what they're doing uh, if you want to build up readership and build up respect. Gotcha. We need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and we come back. We're going to switch and start talking about podcasting. We'll be right back. With Text Expander, you don't have to waste time retyping things you've already worded perfectly. Instead, just use gathered snippets of information using simple keyboard shortcuts or custom abbreviations. You can capture the important pieces of your emails, directions, messages, and data as snippets so you never have to retype them again. From correcting your personal typos and defining industry terms to whole email templates, reusing your info has never been faster and it works everywhere you type. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, and iPad, and now Chrome too. Listeners can get 20% off their first year by visiting textexpander.com slash podcast. How cool would it be to grow your practice in your chosen area of law without spending time or money on business development? Now you can with ARAG. ARAG is a leader in legal insurance, and it works a lot like medical insurance. When you become a provider on the ARAG network, you consult with and represent clients for various legal issues, from writing a will to dealing with bankruptcy or divorce. ARAG does the rest, seriously. They'll connect you with new clients, they'll pay you directly, they'll even collect client feedback and share it with you so you can keep growing your business. Visit araglegal.com slash lawyerist, that's A-R-A-G legal.com slash lawyerist, to join the network for no fee and start growing your practice. And it is all about the growth. In fact, more than 90% of ARAG members say they are more likely to consult with an attorney when something goes up than if they didn't have legal insurance. Check it out at araglegal.com slash lawyerist. That's A-R-A-G legal.com slash lawyerist. There's more to answering a phone call than just pronouncing your name correctly. And I think that's what sets Ruby apart from all the other receptionist services out there. I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of people who work at Ruby, and from top to bottom, it's full of the kind of people you'd love to spend time with. I guess it's something in the coffee they serve. And after all, when someone calls your firm, that means they are going to be spending time with your receptionist. You may think you get to make a first impression when you pick up the phone, but that's not how it works. Maybe your receptionist is just on the call for a minute or two, but that's all it takes to form a first impression. So it's a good idea to make sure your receptionist is the kind of person you'd want your callers to spend time with. It could be the difference between a big case and a big fail. Don't worry, Ruby can handle pronouncing your name right. They'll also help you make a great first impression. And now Ruby can even help you connect with clients right on your website with 24-7 live online chat. You can find out more about Ruby receptionists and how to make a great first impression at callruby.com slash lawyerstpod. Okay, Bob, we're back. So we've been talking about the state of legal blogging. What about the state of legal podcasting? When did you say you started Lawyer to Lawyer? 2005, we started wow. it. I'm trying to remember when Serial was, because we that's what inspired right us. <laughs> yeah. I thought we inspired you, Sam. Uh, you absolutely did too, Bob. <laughs> Our preview episode was 2014, so we came along nine years later, wow. and that would have been right around 
I think you could call that like the heyday of or the birth of the current blogging trend, really, because that's that feels like Serial really kicked things off. Does that sound right? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we were definitely not on the cutting edge. We were just following the trend at the time. I don't think we need to answer the question of what is podcasting in 2019, do we? It's. I think that's maybe clearer. Maybe not. I don't know. I think it's clear. I mean, there's certainly a lot of different approaches to it. Mm-hmm. You know, what we're doing here is one approach. Uh, I still see lawyers who will just like get on a recording and talk for 15 minutes or something. And <laughs> I don't like that approach so much. Well, and there they're, are some podcasts that are kind of like those. Ones. Yeah. There's some like those keyword stuffed blog post versions of podcasts as well, where yeah. lawyers think that, you know, somebody who's getting divorced is going to subscribe to their podcast, which seems unlikely to me, but, <laughs> yeah, right. and I guess yeah. there are two different, at least two different kinds of podcasts. There's like, there's this, there's a conversation, which is sort of the yeah. talk radio of podcasts. Yeah. And then there's the really well-produced polished ones like Pope Hat's Make No Law with Legal Talk Network or like Serial or yeah. most of the public radio podcasts are sort of like podcast versions of radio shows that have crazy production value. Right. I mean, there are sort of these long form, like I know the really big podcasts like Joe Rogan, he publishes like four hour episodes that just right. wander all over the place and I can't listen right. to, but... That's going to yeah. lose me all kinds of listeners, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, what's big, what, the biggest thing that's changed in the time that I've been doing it is just the sheer number of it. I, you know, there are so, so many. I mean, when I started, as I said, we were literally the first on the Legal Talk Network, the first podcast they had. I mean, there was Denise Howell had a podcast sure, and there yeah. were a couple of other people who had podcasts. But, you know, again, you could count on one hand the number of legal podcasts there were at that point. And now it seems like every day I'm getting, you know, an email or a notification of somebody has just launched a podcast. And so it's harder, you know, it's definitely harder for somebody starting one now to build an audience, to make a name for themselves as a podcaster, because there's a lot of competition for people's ears. But that's true for blogging too, right? Like maybe blogging is not as as hype as it was at one point, but the internet is stuffed. There's plenty of stuff on the internet. (laughs) It is true. Making room for yourself is hard. Absolutely true. You know, I, I think on the one hand, you can think of podcasting as audio blogging because it is the kind of thing where a podcast needs to be something that comes out fairly regularly over time. And so in the same way as a blog is a series of chronologically ordered posts, a podcast is similar. Although I think it's a lot easier to polish up a blog post in writing than a podcast because audio editing takes time and skill and production value and stuff that that writing doesn't necessarily or at least is different about. I mean, what's good about podcasting, what I like about podcasting is there is a degree of intimacy about it that you don't get through writing. You know, writing can be very intimate, of course, and, and, you know, some of the great writers make that experience true. But for a listener to be sitting there with headphones on or, you know, whatever their earbuds in or whatever, listening to somebody talk, it makes you feel somehow that you know that person in a different way or or better. I didn't think I had a voice for podcasting, but people say they like it and they recognize me for it and they feel like they know me before I I actually meet them. And that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you can make the joke about the fact that I have a face for podcasting, but uh, <laughs> you uh, definitely have a voice for it. That's a whole other topic. But, yeah. you know, I've, I've had I, and it, just since I started the one I've been doing over the last year, uh, some some are good, some have been terrible. But, you know, a couple of them have really drawn some really kind of a, emotional reactions from the guests in some way. They, yeah. they did an interview with Mark Britton. And I, I know you've done an interview with Mark Britton, too. But we, we did an interview with Mark Britton right after uh, he had uh, left Avo, sure. and uh, yeah. you know, he was really he really spilled spilled some uh, <laughs> insights yeah. and emotions and, and whatever else during that interview. And I've had a just had a tremendous amount of response from listeners to that that episode, who kind of really felt that there was some emotion coming out from him on that show. So you know, it was it was really interesting. Do you think we're obviously both podcasters and bloggers? But one of the things that I wonder about is podcasting not a, not a fad exactly. But like it's unquestionably popular, but it feels like, you know, the, the revenue model for lots of podcasts is not quite figured out yet. And most people still don't listen to podcasts. So I'm wondering if like the market penetration is there. I'm just kind of wondering, like, is this hype or is it here to stay? And is this really one of the sort of the underpinnings of the future of broadcast publishing media, whatever? Yeah, I, I remember I did a blog post, I don't know, five or more years ago about the kind of the, the roller coaster ups and downs in, in podcasting's popularity, because it, it's it has gone up and down in a couple of different cycles over the years that I've been doing it. Mm-hmm. 
It feels like it's here to stay right now, uh, in in part because I think there's always a place for audio storytelling and audio interviews over video. People, it's it's just convenient for people. And radio radio doesn't cut it anymore. I, you know, nobody listens to the radio. Well, that's what any- I'm wondering. Like, if podcasting is like the future of talk radio. Spotify and Apple Music are the future of music radio. YouTube and Netflix are the future of Blockbuster and TV, maybe. I guess I just want to say the future of things a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's going away. I think there will be, I don't know, there's got to be some kind of a correction, uh, maybe somehow. It, you know, you just can't have tons and tons of people putting out new podcasts and, and have them all continue. I, I, I don't know how that, exactly how that plays out. I mean, I, I know just in my own podcast, you know, when I left the Legal Talk Network, I talked to Adam Cameras, who's the the CEO and president of the Legal Talk Network about it. And he said, you know, you're you're may not be aware of how hard it's going to be to build up an audience for your podcast. And I and I kind of has that proved to be true. Uh, yeah, it's tr- it's proved to be true. I mean, it's I, I've done OK with it, but it's it's hard. It's mm-hmm. It's not. You know, as simple as dropping a podcast and, and all of a sudden everybody right. starts listening to it. And and that, you know, and I've got a pretty good reach with, with just between my, my, you know, my Twitter followers and my blog and a few other podiums that I have there. I, I you know, it wasn't that hard for me to get the word out about it. But, uh, you know, I don't I've certainly never gotten anywhere near the numbers I've had. For lawyer to lawyer, where we supposedly I forget what we had, but we had we had pretty good numbers on that. I'm sure they still do. And so it's tough for people to build that up. But I guess one of the things podcasting has that blogging doesn't anymore is that RSS was what really made blogging a thing because you there was a place that you went to follow all of your favorite blogs. Now that's either on Twitter or you have to go visit them. But podcasting is still very much something you subscribe to. So yeah. when you left lawyer to lawyer, you also left behind your subscriber base. Right. Exactly. That's it. But, you know, at the same time, it's not just about the numbers. It's about reaching the right people for the audience that you want to reach, which is true for blogging as well. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, there's such an obsession with numbers, right. in, in especially when law firms get into this stuff because, they, you know, it's generally driven by their marketing people and, and all they care about are, are the raw numbers. And I've always felt like for my blog and for my podcast, it's more important that I'm reaching the right people than that I'm reaching lots of people. I think that's a really important point. And it's one of those things where like uh, where I mean, it's true for blogging and podcasting is like, who do you hope listens to that? And do you really think they will? You know, like if all you're doing is spewing out SEO optimized marketing copy, um, nobody wants to read that. Your audience is Google and Google's spider. And that's great and all. But Google spider is trying to predict (laughs) the preferences of actual human beings. And so it's not going to like your shit. And podcasting is kind of the same. There's no SEO thing, but there are still plenty of people pumping out just garbage podcasts. And I feel like it's because they haven't really thought about it. Like I can see a way to create a podcast that would be useful to people who are getting divorced. But I think it would have to be approached differently than just discussing the law of divorce. Because that's probably not what people come for. And, you know, so really thinking through, like, who is your audience and why do you think they will actually tune in? And is a podcast the kind of thing that they're going to want to listen to? Like, when and how are they going to do that? You know, people listen to podcasts mostly in the car while doing housework or while exercising, I think. (laughs) So (laughs) are people going to be comfortable (laughs) listening to your thing during those times? So, Right. You've just described my life. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What advice would you give to somebody starting a legal podcast today or a lawyer who wants to start a podcast anyway? You know, I think there's a couple of things. I, I, I think one piece of advice is that it's more work than you think it's going to be if you do it right. I think if you're going to do something like this, if you're going to do an interview show, I mean, I find I, spend some time, you know, preparing in advance of a show. I, I think about it. I, I do some research. I, I plan out. I read some... their, if somebody's written a book, I read the book. I read their website. I, yeah. Yeah. Same. So that, of course, that's goes with this format. You know, I think there's something to be said also for thinking about the production value, the production quality. You know, I, even though I left the Legal Talk Network, I'm always happy to sing their praises because they do a really good job with the production work around the podcast that they Mm -hmm. put out. And they put out podcasts that sound professional uh, and that look professional in the way they're, they're marketed and and presented on, on the web and everything else. And I think if you're if if you're in the legal field and you're going to be putting out a podcast 
to reflect your practice as, as a professional or your firm, you certainly want to make sure that that podcast is produced with the same kind of professionalism and conveys the same kind of professionalism. That means good good quality audio, good production value, and, and whatever else that goes along with that. Yeah, it's one of those things where on the one hand, it's not that hard to do yourself, but on the other hand, it's quite time consuming to do well, no matter how you do it. Like you're either going to sit there and plan out a story style podcast, or you're going to prep for an interview or what, you know, there's time and then quality and audio quality. You need a quiet place. You need good equipment. You probably need an editor. Yeah. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. But it ends up being a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I agree. Here, I get to sit here <laughs> talking to you for half an hour and it's just fun to do that. You know, it, it's, it's a lot of fun and it beats uh, working for a living. <laughs> I think sometimes it does feel like work, but <laughs> yeah, I think there is, there maybe was, I don't know if there still is, but there was this idea that podcasting was basically just turning on a microphone and recording a conversation that people right. would want to listen to it. But as you alluded to earlier, we're listening to podcasts in fairly intimate environments, which are also fairly high fidelity listening environments, right? Your your car stereo, for many people, is the best stereo they own. And your headphones are, they're the best speaker system you own. And so like your voice is coming in under pretty clear circumstances right. where um, if your audio quality sucks, it's going to grate on the listener's ears. I, I was invited to be on a podcast once that was like just recorded over cell phones with no editing, no, you know, no framing, no music on either end or anything, which is not a big deal, but like it was just a rambling, low quality, low fidelity mess. And I declined because I thought it would make me sound like crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no matter what I used. Yeah. I'm sure you, I, I don't know. Know what kind of setup you have in your in your office, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure mine is both, the same as yours because have... Legal Talk Network gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, we've got good uh, we've got good mics and good recording equipment, and it doesn't cost very much to do that. Really, you can get you can get a, a nice setup in your office for pretty low cost. Something else that I have found that I really, I don't know how to put this, a lesson for me in podcasting is that if given the opportunity to record somebody live over recording somebody, you know, via Skype or, or some other way, I much prefer to do a live conversation with them. And so when I, you know, I, I've got some portable podcasting gear that I bring with me. And when I go to a conference, of course, again, here again, of course, the Legal Talk Network people are famous for this because they set up a whole table with mm -hmm. mics and everything else. And I, I'm not doing that, but I do bring uh, some portable recording equipment. So whenever I go to a conference, I'll try and schedule one or two recordings there. Sometimes no, just off on the spur of the moment, I've, I've had moments, you know, somebody will, I'll meet somebody that I've been wanting to talk to or, or uh, see somebody speak and uh, I'll walk up to them and say, hey, <laughs> any chance you want to go sit down right now and have a conversation? Do you bring your same microphone setup? Well, I have various microphone setups. Okay. So I have the heavy one, <laughs> yeah, the heavy setup <laughs> where I've got two uh, uh, Shure mics and tripods and all of that, which, you know, if I'm going somewhere uh, with a big suitcase, I'll, I'll I'll bring that. But I've also experimented with some uh, cheaper mics, uh, some lav mics that just plug into my iPhone. So I have that too. And I'm wondering, like, would it work to just sit down and record a podcast with a couple of lavalier mics and my iPhone? I think it actually would work okay. It does work. It, you can screw it up uh, or not. I've got a, an app on my phone that records in a high, a high bit yeah. rate. Uh, when I was in Russia, for example, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to bring all my recording equipment because I wasn't sure how, I don't know, I was a little worried about going through security that maybe somebody would wonder why I'm lugging around all this security equipment. So I just brought <laughs> lav mics and I sat down and recorded a couple of podcasts in Russia and they came out pretty well. One of them was unfortunately in a bad room, so I had bad echo in it, but mm. uh, the mics were okay. And then there's a little thing called the Zoom that a lot of people use. The Zoom uh, H4 Pro is it, I think is the number. That's a great little unit you can pick up for under 200 bucks on Amazon and uh, you plug in, uh, you can plug in Shure mics or you can just have the Zoom unit just sitting on the table between you and another person. And you'll get really high quality audio. That's a good idea, Bob. I might steal your idea. Yeah. <laughs> now we're geeking out on equipment. No, which I know, is okay. but it's, you know, an example. <laughs> I was at a conference uh, back in the fall where Josh Browder, the, the, the guy who created mm -hmm. Do Not Pay and, and all that stuff, I, I, I just saw him there. I had never met him before. Uh, and we had talked a couple times, but I never physically met. I walked over to him and said, hey, any chance you want to sit down and record an episode of my podcast? And he said, oh, I love your podcast. I listen to it all the time. I'd love to. And we just walked off to a room and talked. I had no preparation or anything else, but it came out pretty good, you know? That's great. So if someone were going to start a podcast today, obviously uh, we've given them some guidance on equipment now. And, and we've talked about audience um, monthly, weekly, daily, occasional, 
Not daily. I mean, unless you're a glutton for punishment. I think frequency brings more listenership, uh, but frequency is hard. Mm hmm. I'm doing mine weekly. When I did the one with the Legal Talk Network, we did that for many years weekly. Uh, and then at some point, mm -hmm. we broke it down to every other week, more because they were having trouble handling the production side of it on a weekly basis. Than <laughs> yeah, when we initially took our podcast to them, they said, no, weekly is too much. Yeah. And then when we offered to do the production ourselves, then they said, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's work doing it weekly. And and again, I, you know, you, you and I kind of do this partly for a living. I mean, we, 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 have, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we have time to do this. But if I was practicing law full time, uh, I couldn't imagine doing this weekly. I think monthly is fine. But again, I think the more you can do it, the more your listeners will come to, you know, look forward to it and expect it. I think regularity is probably maybe even more important than frequency. I think so. People come to expect it yeah. at a particular time. Yeah. I think maybe I would add that in the spirit of my podcast, my recent podcast with David Colarusso and the idea of Chesterton's Fence, there are a lot of people starting podcasts that are essentially already done, you know, that people are already doing the same subject in a similar way. So I think it's probably worth doing your research and making sure that you are coming to it with, this is true for blogging as well, but make sure that whatever it is that you think you've got to say has a little bit of distinctiveness to it that's a little bit original or that you've got your own unique spin on it. And it's not just that you're going to find yourself saying the same thing in a, with different words than everybody else already has. That's a, a very important point. Uh, you know, it's more important now than ever because of the large numbers of podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more likely that some Somebody uh, that I've identified for an interview has just been interviewed by somebody else on their podcast. And there's uh, definitely a large amount of yeah, that going on. There's around. a lot of that going on. <laughs> and if, if, you're, if you're podcasting about, you know, legal tech or legal innovation, uh, there are a lot of the usual suspects making the mm -hmm. podcasting rounds. I mean, I, I guess that's one reason why we try to have a lot of people on our podcast who have nothing to do with law practice so that we're bringing different things to our readers. But, you know, you and I both interviewed Mark Britton because he's super interesting and his experience with AVO was interesting. And relevant for our listeners. So yeah. how confident are you that we will still be reading blogs and listening to podcasts in 2029? Um, give me, hmm. give me like a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, 2029. I'm not so sure I'll be here listening to them in 2029. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I actually, I, I, well, all right, I'll give you a, I'm going to say a hundred percent. Cool. On that optimistic note, I think we can wind down, okay, Bob. Okay. I'm glad you didn't ask me to explain that. But I... <laughs> nope, you don't have to put any explanation. I, I think my hunch is that podcasts and blogs are going to be around for a good long time, but I think popularity is going to wax and wane. And we may, I think podcasting is probably going to go through some of the same changes as blogging, where it becomes more corporate than you know individual yeah. podcasts. And I'm just not sure what that ends up looking like in the end. Right. But I think there's a, given the change, Changing media landscape overall, digital media is going to become stronger and stronger. And, and yeah. it, it kind of, I don't want to say individual digital media, but it, the, the big media companies are, are going to be disappearing and, and individuals or small groups of people who are producing media in some way, whether you call those blogs and podcasts or whatever they call them, are the future of uh, our you, media. Wait, do you really think you, th I mean, the, like Gimlet was a nice small startup that did podcasting and now it's owned by Spotify. Like Gawker is gone and BuzzFeed is huge and BuzzFeed is the closest thing to a small, you know, blog outlet that there is that, that is making a big splash now. I mean, it feels like it's actually going more and more corporate, not more and more small. Yeah, but at the same time, there are any number across the country of smallish media outlets. You know, maybe I'm thinking more outside of the legal area, but as local newspapers get gobbled up by bigger chains and let go staff and reduce their coverage of communities and courts and legislatures and whatever, what you're seeing are any number of startups that are community-based mm, or, or based on a particular area of focus or interest that are picking up where traditional media has left off. And uh, I think that trend is going to continue to grow. Well, that resonates with me. I mean, I, I see a lot of journalists lamenting the coverage of, you know, local politics or local city, you know, town councils and city councils, because there's no money in big journalism to pay for that kind of coverage. But, you know, a, a passionate member of the community 
can publish a blog. And then when something happens in that community, there's a record and there's there's facts, there's journalism that's being out there that can be the foundation for, you know, when the, the national attention or the regional attention is focused on that town. And it's a value, but it takes somebody who cares about local more than big media companies do because they can't afford to focus like that. Yeah. And not just passionate members of the towns, but I mean, a lot of yep. journalists, a lot yep. of former journalists are, are doing that now. Uh, and uh, there's, there's this company, the sort of community, what they call a community owned journalism network called Civil out there that's been trying to foster. They did an experiment last year to try and do a, a initial coin offering to kind of fund community based journalism. That didn't go so well, but the, but this organization Civil is continuing to go ahead to try and help develop a, a market for the sort of community based uh, journalism and, uh, and funding mechanisms for it. So I, I think that's, I think, a lot of the future. I think in 10 years, a lot of uh, uh, reporting is going to be along that model. Well, I guess maybe our plug should be to our listeners then that to help ensure that Bob is correct, because you don't want Bob to be wrong, do you? Like, that'd be <laughs> terrible. So um, so go sub if you aren't already listening to Law Next, you probably should go do that and like get five of your friends to do the same thing. And then Bob will be right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Bob, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sam. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Oh,